Hi, and welcome to this second in a series of videos for frontline family violence workers and therapists. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders past, present, and our emerging Aboriginal leaders of the future. Uh, this is a collaboration between several agencies and individuals, and the details can be found on the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare website. We'll be giving you a link to all the information and resources at the end of this video. Now, anyone who saw our last video will know that some of our country's top experts gave up their time to be here, and they're back. So not only that, but we have a new member of the panel, and I'm just going to get everyone to introduce themselves again. So, Wendy, you lead off. Um, hello, I'm Wendy Bunston, and I am a senior clinician consultant, uh, infant mental health worker, and family therapist. Welcome back, Wendy. Thank you. Kim? And Coco. Oh, okay, Coco as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I don't know about expert Nick, but I'm certainly the clinical manager of Restoring Childhood at Take Two that sits at Berry Street. Hi, everyone. Thank, thank you. Karen. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Gaunson. I'm a child psychiatrist and I work across a few settings, including um, private practice and giving evidence in the court. And you might notice this, we've got quite a few quirky pop props. Orange colour, not to the orange door. Right. Get the orange in view. There we go. There's the orange. Oh. Everyone's got the orange. Yeah, Helen, if you've got your orange, tell, her, tell us who you are, Helen. Thanks, Nick. Hi, everybody. I'm Helen Fithall, Maternal and Child Health Nurse at Hobson's Bay City Council. Thank you, Helen. And um, we're delighted to welcome another member to the group, Adrian. Uh, welcome, Adrian. Tell us who you are. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm a senior clinician with the Restoring Childhood Program in Ballarat, which is with Berry Street, Victoria. Um, I've also worked um, most recently up um, just up until COVID started as a men's behaviour change facilitator. And um, I have a private practice as well in Ballarat. And um, I just, I work from a family therapy position and I have a master's in family therapy. Oh, fantastic to have you on board. So thank you very much, everyone. My, name is, my name's Nick Carr. I'm a GP writer and broadcaster. Now, this, this whole project came about because of a recognition of the difficulties faced in this time of COVID for anyone who works with family violence. Uh, it's tough enough work at the best of times. Uh, now that we have physical distancing and a restriction on face-to-face -face meetings, there's a whole new world of uncertainty and complexity. So that's why we're here, to try and help. And in our last video, our experts gave some initial suggestions and tips. Now, we got some fantastic feedback and plenty of questions. So my job now is to try and wrestle some answers to those questions from our panelists. But before we do, I want to ask our new member, Adrian, um, a bit about his work with fathers uh, and particularly about the experience of engaging fathers and men in this complicated time of COVID. So, Adrian, you know, let's just talk to that a little bit. Sure. Sure. Um, so I just, I guess, um, fathers, you know, and given the webinar last week, talked a lot about the experiences of women. And I, I think it's important to recognise that a lot of the fathers in terms of the COVID experience are experiencing similar um, things in terms of stress and, fi you know, around finances and um, employment and working from home parenting and schooling. So these are all things that are cr increasing the stress and anxiety um, that I, that's what I'm seeing with the men that I work with. Um, and I think one of the challenges there is that we also know that the increased stress and anxiety is um, an issue that often leads to family violence occurring by men who choose to use violence in the home. Um, so I guess that's, you know, just something to be mindful of and to, for us to hold in our in our thinking, in the work that we are always doing with men. So thinking about the interaction with the family, thinking about the children, thinking about the partners and the risk and the um, safety of everyone involved. Um, so have you seen a change 
have you seen a change in this time? Does there seem to be more risk? Is anything obviously different in your experience? Well, I think one of the things that's different is at the moment how um, fathers are engaging with the family. So where there used to be access or, you know, weekend access, some of that has altered in terms of the, because of the restrictions. So more contact could be happening with children in the home um, over online support like we're doing right now. Um, and this can be really challenging for um, children and for women um, who are, in the home hearing their partner's voice, that could be triggering. For children, it could be challenging because they might feel stuck in the middle. Um, so all of these things are what we have to keep in mind in our work. And we've heard stories about uh, COVID being used as almost a kind of threat um, or a leverage in some way by, by men in some circumstances. Have you come across that? Oh, look, I actually, I haven't come across that at, um, you saying that is the first time I've heard it. So I'm interested to hear from other members of the panel to see if they've got some reflections or um, had some interaction with that. Mm, certainly I have. I've been speaking to Berry Street's family violence areas, both in the Northeast and Hume Moreland and also up in the Central Highlands. And there have been threats from men in regards to telling uh, mothers and children that they actually have COVID-19 house because they could actually uh, infect people with that COVID-19 and that could lead to obviously serious harm, mm. even death. So I certainly have heard that as a thing, um, which is, you know, obviously very concerning. Um, my experiences through people I've supervised rather than the families I've worked with, and I guess it's just another uh, way of exerting influence so it's mm. part of an, a raft of ways of sort of saying we need to stay together or we need to do this or do that because of such and such so I guess it's just another thing now that can come into play. Absolutely Wendy and that is again um, that sort of happened for since the beginning weeks of COVID-19 restrictions some of that power and control being used absolutely by these perpetrators. Mm. It's, I think it's something that's been recognised by the Family Court. There's a fantastic webinar that's free on the Law Week um, website from last week. And they mentioned um, that it's, it's often that exacerbation of pre-existing patterns. Yeah. Um, and, and that the behaviours can be unlawful and will be as recognised as such and will have consequences. And the mm. courts are still running. They actually are fast-tracking through a COVID-19 court. Yeah. And so a point maybe I'm hearing that emerges from that is that um, in some senses, it's no different from any other threat that might be made in a family circumstance. The fact that it's COVID doesn't suddenly change it. There are legalities around these things. There are things that are not okay. And just because it's about a virus doesn't change it. In some ways, I suppose it's no different to other, any other threat or intimidation. Is that That's correct? That's right. That's right. I think um, just thinking about the pattern and of control within families that um, some that men use, um, that men can use who choose to. Um, that's right. You know, there's so many um, patterns or so many behaviours or ways that they do that, um, you know, emotional or psychological abuse. And this is another one that um, it sounds like has come along as well. Mm. And what proved challenging were the actual restrictions. So in actual fact, where women were able to access services, whether the perpetrator knew or not, and often they don't know. Um, and often if they do know, it's framed around the support of the children. So with the restrictions being put in place, women and children haven't been able to leave the house and therefore they haven't had their supports in place. Mm. So you've got all that power and control that's been historically used, but then you've also got legalities sitting around restrictions and not being able to actually leave the house and access services that once upon a time these women and children did, not to mention the women and children that are experiencing family violence that actually haven't been in the system as mm. of yet. So unfortunately, we haven't seen there's also an expectation that parents will use orders in a way that's got a degree of flexibility because the rigidity that can come out of being controlling is actually not in children's best interests. And if it's interfering with them having contact with 
their social support network that's actually not going to help them feel emotionally safe and mm -hmm. connected, which is what they need for their well-being. So that's mm -hmm. something else that apparently the court is looking at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So question I want to ask if I may um, to you, Helen, because uh, maternal and child health nurses are often very much at the front line and particularly when kids are at home so much more. So um, what is the role of the maternal and child health nurse in this complicated time of COVID? And are there particular tips that you would have for how they can work in this different environment? Yeah, look, I think um, one of the things that uh, many of the families will see, or the mothers in particular will see maternal child health as a non-fresh worker that, um, that we see and that they can connect with quite frequently. Um, and when we do talk to them, there are some things to think about um, to start with basic tips like, is it a good time to talk when you're talking to the family, asking them that. This gives the mother a way out of conversation if she needs to. Um, ask if there's a good time to call back. Um, if there's some the perpetrator or someone is in the house or nearby, asking her, is everyone at home with you today? Um, is the phone on loudspeaker? Um, they're very, the tips that you might think, oh, yes, it's quite obvious, but not for everybody, it may not be. Um, and how are you going? Is It's a stressful time, acknowledging that this is stressful for everybody, not just for the parent um, in this, for her as such. Um, you know, how are you coping with as a family being stuck inside together so much? Um, and I think as I mentioned the last webinar is specifically asking how each family member copes um, and it opens up a discussion about who is and who isn't coping and how they might manage what coping mechanisms they might um, take up. Yeah. Yeah. And what about the use of video for maternal and child? child health nurses do you think they should be doing this by voice should they be getting video into people's homes when what would you recommend from that point yeah it's it's interesting we we do have the option at our council that we can use um video option videos but many of them for parents that um don't want to the mother doesn't want to and it's interesting to know why that might be um yeah so but it is an it option just be that, the dirty laundry is lying <laughs> around everywhere yeah, yes, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that we could utilise more. And I think once the restrictions leave with COVID, I mean, this is um, with some of these more vulnerable families, I think some of the uptake of health, telehealth that we've started will definitely be utilised further on down the track for many of these families. Too. Certainly, um, that would be a, a big hope, wouldn't it? I think we've worked out that this can reach such a we can reach such a bigger audience or out more clients we're using this method as well, um, mm. particularly working rurally. I think it's really important. Mm. Yeah. So, um, could so, I just maybe add yeah, to yeah, that? I was going to come um, to you when to, I want oh, to come I must to you have actually. Known. I must yeah, have had, I must have had it, an orange sense about thing. it. <laughs> it's, that, it's that thing about this thing about seeing children which you touched on last time which um, is a question that came up from several people um, responding to the last video um, about um, what happens when we can't see the children because we can't actually physically go there and how should we cope with that so yeah. sorry to cut across you but maybe that's where you were going anyway well I guess as um, I'm still doing family work so I'm doing a lot of zoom work at the moment and um, I'm just sort of thinking through the families that I'm seeing at the moment where most of them are part of the Zoom session. And I work pretty hard to notice the things that the infants are doing in the Zoom session and commenting on those and asking questions about what the parents think they're trying to let us know about their experience. So it's this interesting thing where, um, Infants and children are like, I think, a bit of an add-on in our minds, even though as, as all of us here are very committed to working with infants and children, I still think we have to, to be vigilant about keeping ourselves um, thinking about the experience of the infant and thinking about questions that keep them prominent in everybody's minds. Um, I had a friend this morning text me to say that apparently uh, I think it's Woolworths is going to has trained their staff and there's a 
a word that women can say if they're concerned and a, a place that they can go. And my first text back to my friend was, I really hope then that the children are with them. And I could imagine that um, children might remain at home while a mother goes out shopping. Um, so I guess for me, it's this, this sort of thing of uh, trying to really be creative about how we can um, bring the baby into the space. Um, I've had one very recent session in a in an office space where mother and the baby came in with myself and a worker and we all did social distancing. But um, the reason for that was because myself and the worker were worried about the little one and we just wanted to see for ourselves how this little one was in the space. Um, and it actually facilitated a really good opportunity to talk about some things that perhaps have been worrying us all, but also to think about, okay, how do we work with this? And our game plan is to include an experienced male co-therapist if we can, and to look at doing some, um, some work along, along a, a pathway where we're not a hundred percent sure of how things are at home. There's nothing to suggest that they're not safe, but there's just that niggling sense yeah. one so, has inside. Um, yeah. that, Adrian, you wanted to comment. Yeah, yeah. well, um, I'd love to. Um, I just think, Wendy, on what you're saying, and I, I was thinking about this when I, after I'd watched the, the last webinar that you all did, and that was around just talking about that gut feeling that I think, you know, we all have to, we all intuitively have, um, and how important that is to actually pay attention to that because yes. there may be things that aren't visually apparent, but there's something going on inside of us in this interaction yeah. that tells us that things aren't, aren't going well or there's something. And even if we majorly stuff up, <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe right. it's the old adage of it's better safe than sorry. That that's right. Even if sometimes we overreach or there may not be, I, I know it's such a slippery area. Um, mm. And if you've got, families where there's been an existing history you can feel a bit more confident and go yeah look th there's a pattern here and the evidence would suggest that it's not going to be any better during COVID than it is um, when this isn't around that's right but it's those ones where this they're just you're just not sure there's something there that's making you feel a bit worried yeah um, hmm. and I guess yeah, I don't want to go into details of this particular case, but there's enough things there that make me think, mm, mm. I'm just but what I'm not hearing, feeling What I'm sure. hearing from you, Wendy, as well, is, is just because COVID and social distancing are important doesn't mean we have to be completely governed by that. We can still do face-to-face -face work when we need Workers to. Workers are going to people's uh, and, and houses and, you know, talking over yeah. the fence, you know, they've, people are being very responsible and, and coming up with all sorts of ways of doing yeah. things. And Jess, I, Helen. I, yeah. yeah, I can just say very similar. You could, there's always the excuse of coming in to see the maternal and child health nurse. Yes. Maybe needs an extra weight. And then you can do that and utilise a worker to come along as part of that consultation as well, which is, um, you could just the perpetrator you could say to them, yeah, look, baby and mum only are allowed to go because of social distancing and we need to do it, they need to do mm. away or, you know, those mm. sort of things. And that has been done. Yeah, that's great to hear that maternal and child yeah. health nurses are still doing that face to face because lives can be saved if you go mm. to pick up a breeze, mm. for example. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly so I'm you... hearing that from my family violence colleagues is that the maternal child health nurses can be the entry point into either that secondary consultation that the family violence workers can provide or in regards to face-to-face, because -face, certainly some of the restoring childhood clinicians up are actually providing their, serv their therapeutic services face-to-face, -face. so walk and talks and things like that, yoga um, with young people and all that sort of thing up there. So we are thinking creatively about how we can lay eyes on those families that we do have that niggle, that we do have that gut feeling like you said, Wendy, and we need to listen to those gut feelings because nearly always they're right. Yeah. And I was pleased to hear actually from one of my child protection colleagues 
that uh, they are now um, prioritising not just high risk families for face to face visits, but also they're actually trying to do face to face visits with three and under with all families in investigations now. So yeah, that's great. So, so this this comes comes to a question that came up several times after the last video, which is about safety, um, and what can staff people are watching this what they can do what can they do to improve safety for children living across multiple homes, uh, particularly if someone is using um, tech devices or the children's tech devices to continue controlling the family. Now that that seems to be a really thorny one. Who wants to have a go at that one? Hmm. Well, I've, I, oh, sorry, Karen, you go. No, no, you go, Wendy. You go, Wendy. Oh, huh. I was just, I, was, <laughs> I just thought, thought of it as a bit like with the, the COVID threat, it being just another way of exercising control. And I know that simplifies it all, but I'm not sure that, um, I mean, none of us are probably that tech savvy that we completely understand what that means, because I'm not entirely sure what that means. But I guess there is always going to be some way of thinking creatively about if you don't want to um, release someone from your control, there's going to be all sorts of manner of ways that I've heard over the years of extraordinary things that I think people have done to keep control of other people. Mm. Um, so I don't 100% know how you answer that as opposed to thinking about what sits underneath all this stuff? What's this about essentially in the first place? And how do we address what is the thing that drives using such creatively devious ways of trying to keep someone from leaving you or, or feeling like you're going to lose that relationship? And I guess, and this would be something Adrian uh, would, would speak to is that, and it's not just men, it's sometimes women will do things too. Mm. It's being able to speak to um, how do we get to that, that part of themselves that feel so unworthy and insecure and needing to dominate others that they engage in these sorts of behaviours. And I guess that's where the really crunchy part of this work is mm. with men particularly and with women of trying to unpack all the stuff that's happened uh, in their development that that leads them to using these ways of behaving. And that's mm. the really crunchy part of this work. It's really the, the tough area. And yeah. we can exert all sorts of controls as a society and we can say, yes, the police will come unannounced and check, child protection will come and check, all that sort of stuff. And that goes to some point in addressing this, but it doesn't actually then attend to, well, why would you do that in the first place to people that you love? Mm. Mm. Where's that stuff come from? Mm. Mm. So just touching on that, Wendy, I've got a colleague and a friend, actually, Shelley Houston Munro, who uh, works at Vic Uni, and she's put together a Working Together With Men project. And it's a really grassroots project about, you know, working with men and actually addressing the issue of patriarchy and family violence, obviously. So um, I'd be happy, I won't go into it now because obviously we don't have enough time, but I'd be happy to share that as one of our resources at the end of this webinar because I think it's really important is that, you know, that we do broach this subject, we do broach the subject of power and control and patriarchy mm. in COVID-19 and it's just exacerbated some of those behaviours within the restrictions context. Yeah. You know, um, can I just add to that too, is that in, in the groups with Men's Behaviour Change, I think, you know, power and control uh, topics that are always talked about or should be spoken about because essentially, you know, men have been asked to come to these groups or mandated. Some have come voluntarily, um, which is, you know, um, they've made a choice or their partner has asked them to attend because there's some issues at home that they need to address. And um, I think it's really important that we, we are having those conversations with men. And I find that in those groups, often men, are, you know, there can be defences there, but if you work as you would with anybody in terms of building up those relationships, even in the group process, that's when we can start to have some of those more challenging conversations. And I do find that a lot of men are receptive to that and that some of the feedback that I get from men who have completed groups is, you know, why hadn't, I, I wish I'd had this knowledge earlier. 
in my life. And um, I find that, to, you know, that's a, a, a nice bit of feedback to get back. Um, do we know if that goes on for greater change? It, unfortunately, it's not because it's not an area that is evaluated well around men's behaviour change. But it, um, at least it's a starting point we get to engage with these men and start to have those conversations. Mm. Karen. Yeah, I think they're all important points that you've made. And coming back to the, like the e-safety commissioner website, I think is a really useful website in that it's got sort of practical resources and advice and on what to do with the devices and how to change settings. And oh, yeah. some of this behaviour will be unlawful too. So I guess knowing when we're going outside of our expertise and we need to link people in with legal professionals and police and e-safety commissioner. Yeah. So, and coming back to the technology, a really very basic question, but this is a real one, isn't it? It's sort of the equivalent of someone not turning up to an appointment. Uh, what, what tips do you have when you can't get through, when you're struggling with the technology, you can't actually find people? What, any, any thoughts there? Um, in my work, I, you know, often there are other, you know, there's a referrer who's um, organised the family to engage. Um, or there's already knowledge of other services involved. And so it's sort of just doing a bit of exploration, a bit of backtracking to see if you can, um, you know, find what's happening with the family. Maybe something else has occurred. Um, and so making contact is a challenge at the moment. Um, could be something as simple as data is not available on their phone. They're not able to make those calls. So trying to find any little way to get back into making contact with that client is really helpful. Can I just, to that, um, one of the things you can also ask them if her phone's not being monitored, or just keep that in mind, but saving particular numbers and it may be you as the worker or the maternal and child health under a different name or something as well. That's another um, thing that some of our nurses will do as well. Mm. I would say find, um, sorry. No, you go, Karen. Okay. Uh, respecting the resourcefulness of people and what they're doing with their own safety behaviours. So I find that people often contact me when they need to. And in between, they've been getting help through other parts of their social network. So I might try, you know, several different mediums like, you know, email or SMS or phone call, or in sometimes letter if it's a safe environment to post to. But also just realising that people come and go and that you're one person in their social network and that anything we're doing should be joining their social network, not taking over. Mm. We also had a question that came through after the last video asking us to talk a bit more about dyadic work and how to do that, particularly in this time of COVID. So I might throw that one first to you if I can, Kim. Yes, yeah, sure. So I have been speaking to some of my clinicians in restoring childhood and they've sort of reported back, and Adrian is one of them, one of my senior clinicians in restoring childhood up in the Central Highlands, but some of the Northern team have also reported back some of their examples, which is that they are finding that mums are actually wanting to talk about their infants and toddlers and what's going on for them, um, because they're not just feeling anxious about their experience of family violence and the effect that that's having on them, but also the impact of COVID-19 and the restrictions that have been put in place. So some of the challenges are obviously that the toddlers that are in he he hearing shot, so they can actually you know hear what the conversations is. But what they've done is they've sometimes adapted their sessions so that mum can either do it via the telephone or via Zoom. And we have had a really good take up of Zoom in actual fact with our sessions, as Adrian sort of touched on earlier. But if mum can't do a, a session that's the average length of time, so say 50, 60 minutes, they've actually adapted that work with mum to be done three times over the week. So on a, say, a Monday, 10 minutes, Wednesday, 10 minutes, Friday, 10 minutes, which not only gives us more consistency and regular check-ins to be able to do the dyadic mm. work and partner with the parent, but also to be able to just adapt to that need and allow for our, you know, the mothers and children to participate in, you know, in providing supports to them around what their needs are at that time. So ordinarily, and Adrian, you could 
speak to this in more detail, is that, you know, we wouldn't ordinarily do 10 minutes of dyadic sessions. They'd, of course, be a lot longer. Mm -hmm. I know some of your experiences are. You've got some great experiences that have been an hour, an hour plus. Mm -hmm. If you want and to speak to one yeah. of Yeah. So maybe um, one of the things in, in my work, particularly when I'm doing dyadic work with, you know, the non-offending parent, usually the mum um, and the children is, is the lead up to the dyadic work. So working with the mum specifically on her own um, and setting up the session, what's it going to look like with the children involved? What can we do in that time? And, um, you know, we usually as therapists set up a space in an office, you know, with toys and everything specifically for the family to come and engage with. Um, but I guess we're now sort of throwing that to the parent and saying, actually, what can you set up in this time? And what's going to work for you? What do you think is going to work for the child? And, um, and how are we going to film that all at the same time, you know, and, and follow you around? So um, I've found this to be a really useful um, part of the engagement. And what I'm also finding is that mums are really enthusiastic mm. to, you know, oh, well, my child's going to enjoy this and, you know, we can set this up and we can try and focus things here. And, um, you know, you know, the child might want to show you all around the house to begin with, but then we'll try and settle back here at this one little point. And um, making it fun and playful is, you know, all a part of about the work that we do with children and um, particularly talking about trauma. So, um, it's just important that we have that priming time with the parent. Yeah. Can I add, I guess, because I think the question was around what is dyadic work? Oh yeah. And it's interesting because I didn't know it was a thing per se. <laughs> yeah. I just think of it as like it's family work um, and it's the work you do with the, the children with their parent or parents. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess what it speaks to is it's relationship work. It's not about one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Yep but it's about looking at who's in the, the, the relationship sphere that we're talking about and working with that. And, uh, you know, we I've been supervising a, a mother baby group in South Australia through uh, like I do zoom sessions with them, but they do zoom sessions with their mothers and children, little ones who've been exposed to violence. And, you know, and this is something that, Berry Street in Ballarat is going to also start doing shortly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's become quite interesting about how different mothers have um, become part of that group and the rituals that they have done, which have influenced each other. So it's been a very organic sort of process where it's been both a combination of following the toddlers around and um, for one of the dyads, having uh, the mother sets up the whole space. So she sets a blanket on the floor. She's got the toys set up. Um, it's like this is a ritual that they partake in. And then the workers have actually sent out um, bits and pieces of things to the family so that when they're all together in a group, they can all do things like they've done Play-Doh, made Play-Doh and all sorts of different things. Mm -hmm. So it's it's been a process of one, like Adrian said, both setting up a playful, joyful space, but also being able to work with what the families themselves bring into that space and to think about the relationship constantly, to, to make it something that is overtly wondering about what is happening for the children, what's happening for the parent, what's happening for the children when they see the other children through the Zoom, like Mm. These are little toddlers who are connecting mm. up with little toddlers, other little toddlers through Zoom. So it's a it's a brave new world. Mm. Um, but the but essence it, what's of lovely it is... about that, Wendy? Yeah, what you, what you're describing is what uh, um, Adrian was mentioning earlier. That rather than this being in the professional consulting or therapist's own room, this is in their space, and they've got yep. to set it up to work for them. And there's a beautiful example of someone doing exactly that. Yep. Um, we, we've only got a few minutes to go, so I want to go to our, our last question, which is a really interesting, slightly different question, which came through after the last video which was about how to work and how to help when you've got a parental caregiver whose own mental health is deteriorating. 
um, and where maybe you've got um, a child where the, the only person they have to rely on is someone who in this time of isolation and so on is really struggling with their own mental health. Uh, I might throw that one to you, Karen, um, to, for an initial, initial response if I can. Sure. So um, mental health, ill health is actually the most common complication of pregnancy. And unfortunately, over the last couple of decades, services of um, funding has been reduced. So it's actually harder for women to get the help that they need and for fathers to get the help that they need postnatally and antenatally. Um, so I guess we're in the midst of a Royal Commission into mental health, um, looking at how things can be reformed. And I'm not sure how much priority is going to be given to infant and perinatal um, mental health services. Um, and I guess what's available at the moment varies um, according to your postcode. So um, in the region where I've worked for a long time, we have um, a range of services available through an infant and preschool program where we consult um, to um, different services. So we go to say maternal and child health nurse clinics and do direct consultations where the um, nurse is present along with the parents and the baby. Um, we also um, will do what's called secondary consultations to care teams where we think about what's happening for the family and parents will join those and sometimes the baby's present for those as well. And we do um, tertiary education of services as well. Um, but we don't have funding for the perinatal arm of that. So um, there's huge gaps in service mm -hmm. provision. And so in our region, people often have to access private psychiatrists or the public mental health service, which doesn't necessarily cater for the perinatal period that well. So, um, yeah. But I'm hoping um, there's some yeah. transformation. I just briefly, we here in the West, um, there is Mums Matter. It does a lot with perinatal mental health for women and men as well um, and deals with some with family violence and it's um, a nice bulk billing service that is done in conjunction with maternal and child health within their centres so it can be a nice place for people to families to come to as well. Yeah. But just in terms of what what the practitioner can do um, upskill as much as you can around mental health um, and particularly trauma-informed mental health learn how to listen carefully to what people are telling you um, understand what their experience is, meet them where they are, be genuinely interested and curious about them, think about um, active coping they've done in the past, so what's helped to soothe and calm them before, who do they turn to normally that they can trust that can help them to think more clearly, um, how can they mobilise those supports at the moment, um, can they go back to their GP, you know, it's the modest to check in with how things have changed over time, segue to Nick. Comment on that. <laughs> keep well, that's, okay. a, that's probably actually that's probably actually a very good time to segue because we are out okay. of time now. Okay. Um, but thank you very much for that. Um, next time we plan to actually to focus um, more on rural and indigenous issues. But please stay online now uh, to give us any feedback and also to leave questions because we would like to be able to address those in future videos. So we need to know what you want to know. Um, and you'll also find a whole host of valuable resources uh, put together by this group, which will be available at the event page for this on the Center for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare website. So that just leaves me to say thank you to our experts who've given up their time today. Wendy Bunston, say hi, Coco. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> Coco the dog, Helen. Helen Fithel, a maternal and child health. Karen Gordson, um, child psychiatrist. Kim Schroeder, thank you for putting your tangerine on view <laughs> so prominently, Kim. Um, and Adrian, Metha, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's been lovely to have your insights as well. Uh, I've been Dr. Nick. Thank you very much for watching and look forward to having your company next time.